Welcome everybody to today's uh, Agene Career Webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing these webinars is to keep the bringing the science, our science community together. Also because I haven't had a chance to get out and see you. Um, I'm usually doing a lot of travel, going to different universities and different places, and I really get a chance to um, enjoy the community. Um, so, so I miss you. So. Um, this is a nice size uh, webinar, so maybe at the end, if people want are interested, they can unmute and or um, uh, sh show their video, and um, we can have some discussion at the end if that's uh, of interest. Also, you can use the chat box to ask questions. Um, some of them I might answer while I'm speaking, and uh, some of them um, I'll answer at the end and try and cover all of your questions. So thank you again for joining us. This uh, webinar will be recorded, and we'll have it available uh, on the Agene YouTube site uh, a couple days after this presentation. All right, so today we're gonna talk about choosing a lab or choosing a job. And it turns out there are some specific things about choosing a specific lab job, for example, a postdoc lab or a, a, a graduate student career lab, but um, most of the principles are the same when, charging a, when choosing a workplace as well. So um, I hope that you'll consider these not just as for choosing your next job, but for choosing any job. Um, so what, what happens, what I hear when I talk with scientists, they, they think, oh, I'm very logical, I have a list of what I do and what I don't do and what I want and what I need, um, and they think that everything's based on logic and fact. But when I ask them about their actual reasoning, um, they make these decisions very much based on some gut feelings, like, oh, this seems good, this seems fun, this makes sense, this is what people expect of me. And that's not really the best reason to choose a lab, uh, not at all, it is not at all the best reason. So I'm hoping today to come up with some more facts that can help you end up with a lab that will both be a great experience or a job that will launch you into your next position. Um, so um, bear with me as we get through some intro stuff, but we're going to get into some hard nitty gritty on making these decisions and how to find out information. So um, think about how you decided on your current position. I don't know where you are, what stage in your career, but be honest to yourself. Um, was luck a factor? Uh, did you feel you had no choice? How did it work out for you? Is your boss great? Um, we have to look at some key ways to increase your success because as we know, people don't leave jobs. In general, they leave bosses. And so choosing the, the boss and the culture that the boss has created can make a huge impact on your future uh, opportunities and frankly, your physical and mental well-being um, during your, your study. Um, you know, graduate school is six to eight years, you know. Um, uh, postdoc used to be three years, now it's maybe four, can be as many as eight. Um, and some jobs, you don't want to be hopping around. Maybe a job is, you know, a good stint at a job is three to five years. We've had ad genies who have been here for 10 years. I worked in one job for 15 years. So it's a long time. And, it, you know, it, sometimes I understand you need to choose because you need money and you just need to get a job. Um, but also, when you're in a job, you can be building for your next position and looking for the best thing for you. So this is actually something you can influence. There's a lot of things in your life you can't, in, you can't influence, but you can influence where you work, who you work for, and what you learn from the jobs that you're in. Um, I'm perfectly aware that sometimes you just need to take what you can get. Not a great opportunity, and that's a different webinar, like how to network so that you have relationships so that you aren't tied into a job that you can choose where you go. But once you're somewhere and when you are making a choice, you really want to bring data and thinking and information into that decision. So what should you look for? Um, it turns out that for all jobs, for the most part, many studies have looked at what people really value. And it's not what you might think. Um, in a workshop, if this weren't just a webinar, we would actually do some polling on this. And usually it turns out pretty much the same. Benefits are important, salary is important, but once you make enough money to, make, to meet your needs, so I'm not talking about a situation of poverty or underpayment or people being uh, you know, not paid a living wage, but once you make a living wage, the things that turn out to be important for most people are the things on this slide. Engagement and learning. Are you going to grow? Are we, will the job be challenging? Will you learn? This is super important for scientists especially. We are sort of lifelong learners by nature. It's what we do. Um, and so I think that engagement and learning, you have to find that in a job or you are not going to last long in that position. 
Also coping and balance. Um, you know what your needs are. are. Are you a workaholic? Are you the kind of person who needs separation between work and life? Or are you an integrator? Do you integrate life into your work? You want to have it match what you need because you really need to have some flexibility to make your mental and physical well-being as good as your work well-being. People like to like the people they work with. So if you're go going somewhere where there's a lot of jerks and you're not one, it's probably not gonna be that happy. If you're a jerk too, then maybe that's the right atmosphere for you. But the social exposure that you get is a really important part of um, what you should look for in a job. And finally, congruence with your values. So, you know, whatever kind of um, perhaps political or mental or um, uh, social or moral things that you stand on, um, there may be some positions that are not right for you that won't jive with your values. And so understanding a little bit about your values can really help you make the right decisions. Okay, so you have to know yourself a little. And, um, you know, I can't, we can't go into a whole workshop on knowing yourself right now, but it really is worth taking a step back to think about consciously, what do you care about? What is your moral stance? What's fun for you? What are you good at? It may not be bench work. It may not be writing. It may not be, there may be parts of science, there may be parts of your education that you're better at or worse at. Maybe you want to capitalize on the ones that you're better at. Um, and of course, these strengths and these considerations change over the time in your life. So uh, re mentoring relationships are a good way to explore what's important to you coherently, not just as kind of a thing you dwell on in your own head, or maybe you don't even think about. Um, so please go to the Ad Gene blog. Many of the resources I refer you to are there. Um, there is a way to form a peer mentoring group. You don't need someone very senior or very famous to help lead you through a mentoring relationship. Um, I actually have a blog in the mentoring book and on the blog called um, How to Form a Peer Mentoring Group, which is actually my favorite model of mentoring. And I'm happy to talk to you about that more um, at the end or um, another time if you want to reach out to me. So here's some things that might matter if you're thinking about where you're going to go work. Is it a big or a small company? Think pharma, startup, biotech, giant law firm, boutique, small lab, startup, three or four people, giant lab, 40 people, and you never see the PI. Um, sometimes size makes a difference. Um, doesn't make a difference for everybody. There are easy ways to find out how big the group is or how big the uh, lab is that you're going to. Um, you may want to um, learn about our, if there's enough projects to go around. And those are, these are non-threatening questions you can ask people. Does everybody have interesting projects that they're working on? Um, what would I be working on? What are my initial responsibilities and what would I learn? Where would I grow in a job that maybe is not a specific lab-based job? Um, if you're good at asking for help, size might not be a big factor. So if you come from a big family and you're like sibling number six of 12, um, you're used to making your own way. So a big giant lab might be good for you. But if you're an only child, you might not like the setup where you don't get a lot of attention and you have to kind of do everything on your own, just like what you're used to, what your best learning style is. Um, so it's definitely a good thing to think about what kind of organization you want to go to. I started out in a small lab that got a little bit bigger, but it was embedded in a larger two lab group. So I had sort of the best of both worlds. I worked in pharma for 50 years. I also worked in a very small startup biotech. Um, and I worked at Agine when we were 16 people, and now I'm working at Agine when we're 100 people, which is sort of mid-size. Um, so it's, it, it, it may not be a factor for you. I've been happy and enjoyed all of those jobs, but it definitely was a factor in choosing my graduate lab. Because if I, I actually interviewed in a giant lab that had 40 people and I would have actually been, you know, uh, I, when I rotated through the lab, I was like a small blip on that screen. And I didn't like that. I didn't like the non-communal feel of it. And I sensed that as I was choosing the lab through my rotations. Um, and it was a great experience scientifically, but that isn't the lab that I chose to do my five years of training. And it was an, a really good lucky choice because I wasn't so conscious about it as I should have been. It was a gut feeling for me at the time. And now I'm much more conscious of how important this can be. So here's another thing you might want to think about in the culture. And I'll talk a little bit later about how you find out information about these things. Is the organization, the group, the lab collaborative or is it competitive? Um, and you know what? Maybe you like things a little bit rough and tumble. Most people will say, when out the, oh, of course I want to be collaborative. 
But maybe a little competition from other people is what spurs you to actually do a good job. As long as the lab is ethical and not a bullying type lab, competitive can actually be a good atmosphere for some people. You have to sort of know what's good for you. Um, if you do, you know, know that you are a collaborative person and you, you know, competition um, makes you nervous and anxious, not helpful, um, then you probably want to look for labs where papers have multiple authors, um, groups where multiple people work on teams, perhaps multiple people manage projects, and you can ask those questions. Um, maybe the um, manager, the PI or the manager is helpful in keeping the morale of the group by helping determine ownership of authors, um, who works on what, who tasks go to who, he doesn't just leave the group to, um, I should say he or she does not just leave the group to make their own way, that can lead to a very competitive spirit. Instead, they help and work with the group. Um, maybe the manager takes input from the lab and the group and intervenes if there are conflicts. So I have to say in my, gra in my graduate training lab, um, there were some interpersonal conflicts, pretty serious ones. Someday, if you want, we can talk about that over beers. Um, and the PIs in our, that were on our floor um, knew it was going on, but they didn't really intervene because they were kind of new to their jobs and they didn't really know how. And it was, it could, it had some very damaging effects. Um, I, I loved my graduate lab incredibly. I loved my graduate mentor, but there was a tough time there. And um, wow, it's really not good when the leader of the group can't step in and help resolve issues. Um, good questions to ask when you're interviewing um, in for, for positions. So another thing is who will be your real boss? Does the advisor or hiring manager meet regularly with trainees, like weekly, one-on-ones? Do you have good, uh, will you have a good rapport with that person? Um, are the appointments ad hoc, meaning like they can happen whenever they pop up? Are they regularly scheduled? Do they get canceled a lot? Um, perhaps in a lab, you find out that really the PI is so busy that it's a postdoc who's really gonna be managing you. That's okay if the postdoc is a good mentor. Not so much okay um, if they're not really into it or if they're not a good mentor. Um, you know, does the supervisor, will they be moving soon? Are they stable in their position? If it's in academia, do they have money? Do they have tenure? Um, I didn't work, do, do my graduate work in a tenure lab. I finished my work before my advisor moved to a new position, but you may want to do some research as to whether you're in the middle of that transition. Um, uh, and maybe do you care? Maybe, um, you know, the, anyone in that lab or in that organization seems the people seem good to you and the specific person who's your manager is not so important. Um, that's a great culture to strive for that you have many leaders and many managers that are good. Um, so this may not be a factor in every decision. So um, this is when you have to care about, um, and that is expanding your skill set, uh, especially people that are, so I don't know if everyone online is a scientist or techie, but scientists and technical people always need to be learning. I think they're not happy if they're not learning. I'll speak for myself. I'm not happy if I'm not learning. So how are you going to be learning things? You know, talking to other people who have been in the group, who have worked in the organization, who have worked in that lab. Um, did they grow? Did they learn? What kind of access did they have? Did they get, were they encouraged to do new experiences? experiments, start up new system, new systems. Was there a lot of discussion about literature and learning how to do science, not just here do it, but was there a lot of discussion about the right ways to do science? Um, my advisor was an incredible mentor when it came to critiquing papers. We had these incredibly rigorous journal clubs, not cruel, but rigorous. And he had this thing where he would actually take the figures out of the paper, throw out the whole text and make us interpret the data only um, with the information about how the experiments were done without the interpretation of the authors in the text. which is an incredibly rigorous way to read papers and do journal club. Um, I learned a huge amount about interpreting data uh, in that way. And I, I've always appreciated that mentoring. Um, I, many, many mentors in my science career have helped me do things better. Um, and, you know, this is a thing you really need to um, ask questions about and understand what it's going to be like if you can before you take a position. So how can you find out? I've told you all these things. Who's going to be your boss? Um, you know, how much am I going to learn? What are my opportunities going to be like? What's the culture like? How can you find out? So it's really important that you internalize this concept that you are interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. If you are looking at academic positions, you are probably about to enter into a very long, very underpaid portion of your career. You will be deliriously happy if you are learning science. I was brokeity broke all through grad school, loved every minute of it, got married, had a baby, did all that while pretty much broke. So, you know, was happy the whole time because I had a great 
group where I was really learning and, and it was a, a very supportive of culture. So how can you find that? Um, you re, it, it, you're gonna give your work to a lab or an organization, you deserve to know a lot of information. And so you are really finding out what they are like as much as they are finding out what you are like. So the first thing you can do um, is try and find past or present employees of the lab or the company to talk to. If you have a good network, see my networking webinar. Um, it really helps because the broader your network is, the more likely that you'll find people who are in your, um, who are in your um, organization and um, who are in the organization and can give you advice. Um, another really good trick for labs is to try and hook up and connect with people that are in, in adjacent labs or teams. So the next door lab, the people in the lab at the time might be too afraid to say what's really going on, but the people next door will probably know the gossip um, that there is about that lab. And if there's anything really untoward, if there's a culture of harassment or bullying or um, unethical um, publication, um, they might know. So those are good people to get onto a Zoom call, offer them, you know, send them a beer if they can. Used to be, I would say, if you could meet them in person or maybe do a call, but, um, you know, kind of offline, get as much information as you can about what it's really like to work in that group. Um, and uh, I, I have had many, many people come back to me and tell me how much they learned from that interaction. It's not always possible, but it's a really valuable one. You have to ask questions. So hopefully you'll get a chance to interview either online, hopefully in person very soon. Um, and there's all kinds of questions you can ask that are non-threatening. We actually have some information in um, a blog I wrote, How to Choose a Mentor. And um, I think the link for that will come up. Angela is also posting links. Uh, Angela Abitua from Adgene is posting links in the chat um, if you of the things that I'm mentioning, if that is helpful. Um, so what kinds of things can you ask that aren't threatening? How long do people stay in the lab? Do they do their work quickly and go do something else? Maybe they do their work quickly and go to industry because the PI is helpful with that transition. That might be a good thing. Um, do people not finish? Do they get their degrees? Do they finish their postdocs? Um, what did, you can actually use the internet to figure out where the people and the lab or organization have gone using LinkedIn or using the lab website or ResearchGate, publication history. There's a lot of digging and research you can do. You are scientists and techies, you know how to do that. So where do they go? Um, and, and that is going to give you a lot of information about what the culture can provide for you. Um, you might want to ask stories of, of employees who have advanced in the organization. Hey, is there someone in this group that's uh, got promoted and moved out? What was that like, you know, or that went to a different type of job? It doesn't really comment in a threatening way to the people. You don't want to say, hey, is this a crappy place to work? Because no one's going to answer that question. But you can ask these adjacent questions to start getting at it. Um, what does the organization do about professional development? Um, how does this compare to your past job? And, you know, sometimes those kinds of questions will get you some really interesting answers. So um, it's specifically appropriate to choosing a lab. I just wanted to mention a few things that you should do um, if you can before you choose a lab position. And that could be in industry or in academia. If possible, rotate in the lab for some time or at least spend a day. How people interact and how they um, are work interacting if you watch it and if you see how respectful group meeting is maybe you can sit in on a group meeting that would be a great thing to see how the pi coaches how people coach one another um you know that would be a great thing for you to be able to do i realize it's not always possible but it would be great um do the P trainees in the lab get to at least observe grant writing ideally do they help write grants do they get equipment quotes like do, are they learning how to run a lab if you're bound for academia you should choose a lab where the PI is one that's going to teach you the things that are going to help you run a lab someday, or are you just a, a bench slave and you do what you're told? Um, that's not a learning and enrichment experience. How do people treat each other? How do they treat the admin? You know, are they nice and respectful to one another? Um, do postdocs stay working in the same field if they stay in academia? Um, and finally, um, how often are the lab meetings? Are they regular? What's the format? Um, and other things about finishing. These are all good questions that you can ask. I have a whole list of these questions in the blog that's mentioned here and that Angela posted the link to. Uh, there's a question here. I have a question from um, Angeline. Thank you. What if the lab is new? The group leader is young and just started because there's not much student history in that case. Absolutely. So um, I actually joined a lab where I was probably the second graduate student and there were only like four of us, uh, actually three trainees and the PI in the lab that I did my training in. 
Um, so that is a, a bit of a risky situation. I really liked it because I liked the, the deep and close interaction with all of the people, as I mentioned before. Um, so one thing you can do is someone's a lab head, they have labs they have been in previously, and those are great places to seek out information about what that person is like to work with. Um, most people have a publication history, so you can at least look at publications. Um, and so there may be ways to find information. You may have to ask more direct questions of the PI. You know, what, how do you plan to do this? How do we, how do will we meet? Will we meet every week or will we meet more often? Um, you know, what, what things do you anticipate teaching me this year? You know, how do you feel about academia to industry transitions? Well, you know, you may have to be a little more explicit about your interviewing. Um, do not pass up those labs. They can be fantastic training labs. Um, and so you're right though, that is a little bit harder to get the information that you might need. Okay, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about harassment or bullying mentors. Unfortunately, I hope, when I speak to you, I speak to you because I want you to protect yourselves and end up in a good place. I hope that 10 years from now, we have a lot more responsibility. The mentors have a lot more um, accountability than they do now um, in labs. Um, in offices as well, this is a huge problem. So in labs, you, there really is no accountability. The PIs in most places, if they're a good, they're, and they're great mentors, by the way, if they're good, they're good, but if they're bad, they can be really bad and no one does anything about it. I mean, I don't know if you saw in the newspaper this week or you know the report of this uh, you know, Harvard professor in anthropology who's been um, physically and emotionally harassing women for decades. People knew they didn't do anything about it. It's a mess. I hope that we're getting to a place where it is not such a mess, that if you're gonna get funding to train students, that you have a bare minimum of good mentorship that you are practicing. But unfortunately, there are a lot of bullies um, and there is little oversight. So you need to find out about that before you take a position. Um, and workplace bullying can take many forms. It doesn't have to be physical harassment. It can be mental harassment. It can be overwork. Um, it can be isolation, all these things on the slide. Um, it really can just be messing with your head. Um, that is no way to spend your, your graduate training. You will not be successful and it will have an enormous impact on your future happiness. Um, and when it comes to professional places, you, you really wanna ask questions about how, um, what the culture is like as far as dealing with bad management or dealing, encouraging good management and inclusion, and um, if there is a way, a recourse for harassment. And those questions can be asked carefully of HR. I would say, if you're in a job where this is happening, please get out. If you're in a lab where this is happening, even if you're far in, I strongly recommend that you get yourself out. Um, because, you know, the faster you get out, the faster you're going to get on to a better place that deserves you and you can learn and you can grow. So really don't take it from bullies. Don't take it too long. I understand you have to make a living and it may take a while, but really begin your transition out. I have even worked with people halfway through their graduate careers to finish in a different lab when they were in a really terrible mentorship situation. Um, and that is a good thing to do, even if it means you slightly delay your graduation. Okay, so you really do need to choose a role model because people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. You really want to make sure that you're going to be learning and growing and doing the kinds of things that you want to do. And so all these questions that I've talked about, you really need to get a handle on the culture that you're going to be entering and what the lab head is going to be. Um, one of the things I beg of you is if there are warning signs, do not say, oh, that won't happen to me. I have a backbone. Um, I cannot tell you um, the number of times that people have come to me and said, oh, so here's a, a true story. Uh, one of my AWIS uh, colleagues, Association for Women in Science uh, friends, was looking at a, a new postdoc position and she had interviewed in three labs and in one of the labs, she did this that I recommended. She talked to people in the adjacent lab and she talked to alumni of the lab as well offline. And um, a couple of them raised flags about um, ownership of work. And one of them told her a frank story where she was supposed to be first author on a paper. And then the PI told her in the, you know, right when the paper was about to be submitted, that a man in the lab needed the first authorship more. I don't know what that means, but he needed it more. And though, even though it was primarily her work, he was going to be the first author. And she wasn't even going to be co-author. She was going to be second author. And she had no recourse. That's ended up what happening. She lost her first author paper. She never got another one. And, and in, in fact, she ended up um, moving in a science adjacent career, but not really in science, I would say. And it really had a huge impact on her life. 
my friend tells me this story. She, she got this story from, from directly from the person and says, what do you think I should do? And I said, you're kidding, right? You should not go there. That is illegal and unethical. And that is a bad mentor. And she's like, oh, but that would never happen to me. Literally those words, that would never happen to me. You have very little power in a PI situation where they um, are treating their lab members that way. Until the system is changed, there's very difficult to report and it's very hard to be believed. And really no one can make them do it. They really have no boss. So if you hear those stories, don't go to that group. Do not give your work to those people. They don't deserve it. Um, so um, Leslie Houghton shares some other tips in the chat. Um, talk about, ask about the paper publication output. Absolutely, and you can do that research yourself online these days. Um, does the lab head insist on doing all the writing or is it collaborative? Of course, everyone should participate in writing. You must learn how to write. So, um, you know, you can ask about the process a little bit. And so without asking these directed questions, maybe just ask lab members to describe the process. Again, you don't want to raise their flags that you're being judgy. You just want to get information. So um, a lot of these questions are great, but I think you want to ask them in a way that's, you know, carefully ask them, can you just tell me about how publication works? How long did it take? What did the PI do? What did you do? Um, you know, how long did it take? What was the story? Um, you know, and those kinds of questions can really get at some great information about their process. Thanks, Leslie. Really important process, how the lab works together to write. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about transitioning to industry or working in industry. Um, so, you know, I can't tell you the number of science trainees that come to me and say, I'm in a lab, my advisor doesn't support my transition out of academia, he thinks I'm a failure um, if I don't, you know, look at academic positions. And if we have time in the end and you're interested, I have a few slides on why you might choose an academic or non-academic path. I'm not dissuading you from going into academia. We need great scientists in both. We need diversity and inclusion in both. I love the academic training system. I don't love the way sometimes it is administered, but I love the, the apprenticeship model of science. Um, but if you are thinking you might want to have an opportunity to leave academia as your next career move, um, you may want to choose a lab where you have carefully vetted that the advisor supports this path. If not, ask it explicitly when you are interviewing. Um, I, I feel bad that people are so afraid to ask this question. I'm thinking about industry, PI who I'm interviewing with. What do you think about that? I'm really excited to learn to be a scientist and bring those talents into um, a for-profit setting or a non-academic setting. Um, and so here are some ways that you can look for that. What do um, lab alumni do? What does the publication record show as far as industry collaboration? Um, does the advisor serve on the boards of non-academic institutions? That can be helpful. Um, you know, if you want to consider that path, don't go somewhere where the, the, um, law, the lab head or the boss is not going to be supportive of it. It's an extra hurdle that you don't need and isn't necessary. I haven't really talked about what science you're doing because frankly, except for that, if you know you're going outside of academia, you may want to focus on more marketable, like, um, you know, human type disease systems, but you know what? We never know where the next science discovery is going to come from. So um, it doesn't really matter what science you're doing, to be honest. It really matters um, what, um, what culture you have, what, that you learn how to do science, that you learn a good culture of, you're in a good culture of mentoring and growth and technical learning. You know that you can transport your science skills to any topic. Um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, there are some ways if you have a specific field you want to end up working in and you know that, not that many people do, you can make choices based on the topic, but to be honest, it's much more important that you choose a good mentor than that you choose a good science question. Um, so Christine has a comment. Um, I've been in labs where different members have very different experiences depending on the project. No one's been severely bullied, but several people were during and after my time. What other flags of a bullying boss should a prospective student explore? Um, I guess the only way I know how to do that is to really talk to the people, as I mentioned, alumni of the lab, current people in the lab, and um, uh, neighbors of the lab is a good one because then you'll get a, a perspective. Alumni are good because they might know some of these stories, even if they didn't experience the bullying. Um, but I guess um, if you really are surprised and you get into a lab where the, P, the, the mentor or the boss of the group that you're in is, is, is destructive to your mental health, um, what I would do is just plan to move out as soon as you possibly can. Um, and so, um, but I have rarely met when people do work through this interview process where they spend the time to find out, um, I've rarely met someone who hasn't been able to get a hint of this. And as long as they don't disregard it and say, 
that won't happen to me. There's a pretty good whisper network. Um, there's actually, you know, I have heard stories of where students and labs have talked to all of the first year students and warned them not to come to their lab because the PI was such a terrible bullying mentor um, and students still come. So please listen to the whisper network. It is there if you seek it out. So it is actually okay to be happy. Um, we have a culture of suffering in academia and, um, you, know, it, you know, you may hear a lot of really angst and pain, but the fact is you can, it can be hard to get through um, graduate school or pursue a scientific career, but um, you really actually can be happy for the most part. And so um, apropos of your question, Christine, um, there are some questions that you can ask to see if people are actually happy. Do they have a balance with their lives? Do they speak reflect, speak um, admirably of one another? Um, did they say they would do it again? Would they make the same choice again? Um, and so these are again, non-threatening questions that you can ask people um, to get at that culture. Are people actually happy enough here to grow and learn? Um, and also looking for outside interests. So um, if you are, unless you are a person who just does one thing, you don't mind working whatever crazy hours some crazy boss or PI requests of you, then you don't have to worry about this. But if you wanna have a life, and say you have a hobby or a, you know, you're a triathlete or you, for me, I read a lot of fiction. Um, you know, you wanna have a family and you wanna have a balance with that. Um, you may wanna ask questions about are people happy in those choices that they've made um, or are those choices not respected in this setting? Um, and there are ways that you can um, look for signs of an outside life. So what are the warning signs? Um, if you hear people speaking disrespectfully of one another, uh, the supervisors or the lab mates or each other, that's a big warning sign. If they're speaking disrespectfully of each other, they're probably disrespectful of each other and they will be of you as well. Um, that may not be a peer choice that you wanna make. Um, if you don't get to talk to other employees in the group alone, if you're not interviewed by the co-people you will be working with or the co-lab members separately without the, the boss being there, that's a big red flag. Um, I would never go to a job where I didn't have a chance to speak separately with the people that work in a group. Um, when you ask questions about lab culture, people do not jump to say, oh, I love working here. They're, they're hesitant. Um, people don't like to lie, a lot of them, but they won't say anything bad. So you have to really watch that. It's going to be hard if we're doing phone interviews. Hopefully you're at least on video call. Um, so that's another thing to, com com uh, thing to consider. I've mentioned the Whisper Network. It's there. Look for it. And you know, if you have a gut feeling that something's not right, please listen to that gut feeling. Um, you know, you might make a mistake, of course, you know, but this is not your last job, it's just your next job. And so um, it would be really good to be careful about, um, you know, if something worries you, respect that worry because there's a good chance that you're right. Okay, so just in summary, um, you know, it's really good to kind of sit down and write a pros and cons list. Um, it may not help you decide pros and cons list, you're not voting, but it may, may help you see things that you're missing. I mentioned about listening to your inner voice. If you feel nervous about what people are saying about the organization, um, then respect that. Um, have good mentors, that's always a good thing. You always have choices. So do not feel tied into one uh, decision. You know, there are other positions out there. Usually I know that that's not always true, but for the most part. Um, what are you looking for? What does the ideal culture look like for you? That was the beginning of my talk. Think about like, what are the things that are important to you? And you can always change your mind. Even in a lab situation, you can always change your mind. Um, how do you want to feel? So work should feel like sometimes it's great. I know work is hard. It's not always fun, but sometimes things fall into place. You have some confidence. You have some intense concentration and focus where you're listening and you're succeeding at problems. And one person said to me, sometimes it doesn't even feel like work when I'm here. Um, you can't always be in that zone, but even if you're occasionally in that zone, it can really make all the difference for your confidence, for your health, um, and for your future. So that's really what you're looking for. Um, happy dance, at least once in a while. All right. 
So um, before I finish up, I have a few more slides and I'm happy to take more questions. I thought you might be interested on what's happening at Agene during this crazy time. Um, for those of you who don't know, Agene is a nonprofit um, uh, organization that has a collection of research materials, mostly plasmids, but also viral vectors um, and other DNA-based and DNA-derived um, materials. We help scientists share them. Um, we collect them here in our repository in Massachusetts, outside of Boston and Watertown, and we send them to scientists around the world. Uh, these are all the things in the collection these days. Who knows? We may be doing more things in the future. Um, and we have distributed over 1.3 million materials to scientists in 100 different countries. Um, and we've, we've now distributed way more than 15,000 viral vector, prepared viral vectors, AEV and lentiviral, to scientists in about half that number of countries. So um, it's a pretty big scale. Right now, distribution is a little bit less because a lot of labs are closed, but we're still uh, please check out our COVID-19 resource. It's really useful if you're working in that area. We also have a huge amount of educational resources. And one reason why I talk about this is many of the things I talked about today are, um, we have career blogs on the Agene blog, but also fantastic technical blogs for molecular biology, for science, for neuroscience, for all kinds of things, fluorescent proteins. Um, we have tons of protocols and um, that people view. And we also have great video protocols on our YouTube site. We answer technical support questions by email and online, thousands of them, uh, helping scientists do their, their molecular biology mostly or their viral work. Um, we have tons of great eBooks that you can download. They're free. Um, the mentoring one I mentioned, we have a science careers book, which is fantastic. Um, and then we have uh, CRISPR 101, fluorescent proteins, viral vectors, all kinds of great technical resources. Great place to start if you're starting um, on um, molecular biology. So during the pandemic, we're still working, um, distancing in masks. Uh, kudos to the Agenes. This is, I know you are all suffering. This has been super tough. Um, and so far we've actually distributed almost 6,000 materials related to COVID-19 to scientists all over the world. Um, and so we're, we really, the team geared up fast. We're accepting deposits at an alarming rate um, so that we can get these materials out to everybody who's working on to solve this problem for the world. Um, and we're super proud of this work. Um, the tiniest silver lining to this horrible situation is that more scientists have made their materials completely openly available to both academic and industry-based scientists at for-profit organizations. So if you are studying COVID-19, there's a ton of um, resources and there's a ton of plasmids now. It used to be none, now we have many more that are available to all requesters, not just academic labs. Um, so I'm happy to take any other questions now. Um, uh, the Ad Genies are here to help. I'm here to help. Um, and check out the blog if you want to see other career resources and our YouTube site where we have a number of other great career webinars. Um, any other questions? You're welcome to go off mute also because we're not so many people here. Okay, someone asks, uh, what if you like the lab but have reservations about the organization? Um, so that's a, I, again, I think you'll have to ask questions about the people in the lab about how much the organizational problem affects their work. Um, I, you know, um, I think I'm going to go out on a limb here and say something sort of risky. There are, there are organizations that have, um, you know, that have an overriding organization that perhaps there is bad gossip or bad PR about, but the micro lab that you're in is a great one. Um, I think you need to pay more attention to the micro lab as long as it's not a big moral concern for you because your day-to-day -day work and the learning and the living that you're going to do are really affected more about your department, not about some sort of general policy or atmosphere. So it, it may, that job may not last forever, but if you're gonna go to a group in a lab or a, or a department in an organization that itself is good and the boss is good, um, then that's worth looking at anyway. Um, one thing to be understand about non-academic positions, your boss can change any time. There can be a reorg, you can be moved. Um, and if you get moved somewhere that's really terrible, you may need to go find a new job. But with that caveat, um, you know, I think the group that you're in is more important than the, the larger cultural issues, with some exceptions, but in general. All right, great. Um, thanks so much for joining me today, and good luck with all of your research, and um, I hope uh, this has been helpful. Take care.